Good day and welcome to my channel. I'm John. Today's segment will be The Golden Girls. Golden Girls was created by Susan Harris that aired on NBC from September 14, 1985 to May 9, 1992, with a total of 180 half-hour episodes spanning seven seasons. The first episode, Coco the Cook, played by Charles Levin, was dropped. The writers observed that in many of the proposed scripts, the main interaction was between the women, and the cook would distract from their friendship. The character of Sophia had originally been planned as an occasional guest star, but Getty had tested positively with preview audiences, so the producers decided to make her a regular. It stars Estelle Getty as Sophia Petrillo, B. Arthur as Dorothy Spornak, Rue McClanahan as Blanche Deverell, and Betty White as Rose Nyland. About the set and how it came to be, the show's designer, Ed Stevenson, took inspiration from his time living in Florida to design a Florida look for the Golden Girls house set. The wooden accents, columns, and doors were painted to mimic bald cypress wood popular in South Florida homes, with rattan furniture and tropical printed upholstery chosen for the furniture. The kitchen set seen on the Golden Girls was originally used on an earlier Whit Thomas Harris series, It Takes Two, which aired on ABC from 1982 to 1983. However, the exterior backdrop seen through the kitchen window changed from the view of Chicago high-rises to palm trees and bushes for the Miami setting. Space was limited on the soundstage, so when the kitchen was off camera, it was usually detached from the rest of the set and the space used for something else. The doorway from the living room with the alcove and baker's shelf just inside was designed to give the illusion that the actors were walking into and out of the kitchen. The home used for the exterior scenes could actually be found in Los Angeles, California, the city of Brentwood Heights, and was chosen for its Florida look, saving production quite a bit of money. <laughs> There's a whole lot of information on all four of them. I'm going to keep it down to the minimum. Getty was born Estelle Scher in New York City on July 25th, 1923, to Charles and Sarah Scher, Jewish immigrants from Poland, at the family's apartment on 257 East 2nd Street on the Lower East Side, which also served as the storefront for the family's glass business. She had a sister, Rosalind Roz, and a brother, Samuel David Scheer. As a child, she was known as Eddie, a nickname that stemmed from her sister's inability to pronounce Estelle correctly. As a weekly treat, every Friday night, her father would take their family to the Academy of Music on 14th Street to watch a film and a live vaudeville performance. And while watching those performances, Getty decided she wanted to become an actor. After graduating from Seward Park High School, she continued to live at home with her parents. Her father, doubtful she would be able to forge a successful career in acting. She worked as a secretary as hours allowed for her to attend auditions in the late afternoon and evenings. At 24, Getty was married to Arthur Gettleman on December 21, 1947, nine months after they met. They were married 57 years. He died in 2004. He was 85. They had two kids, Barry and Carl. Getty won roles in the New York theater circuit. Finally, in 1982, Nearing 60 years old, she found her breakthrough role as Mrs. Beckoff in the Broadway production Torch Song Trilogy. In 1985, the role heavily influenced Wit Thomas Harris Productions to cast Getty for the role of Sophia Petrillo. Getty relied on wigs, clothing, and heavy makeup to age herself to look the part of a mother in her 80s. 
In reality, she was a year younger than her television daughter, B. Arthur, who played Dorothy. In 1988, Getty won her most notable award, the Primetime Emmy Award for Outstanding Supporting Actress in a Comedy Series for her work on the show. And with these clips, it would be by far more surprising if she did not win. <laughs> Blanche was right. She said you were incorrigible. I guess I deserve it. I always say she's a cheap slut. <laughs> what is it? Is she younger, more attractive, more desirable? We got two out of three, Blanche. <laughs> possibly think I'd continue seeing him. Blanche Devereaux has never shared a man. Or a pizza. <laughs> this nightgown is so sheer, I believe you can see right through it. <laughs> oh, hello, Fidel. Hello, Blanche. How are you? You don't have cataracts, you tell me. Beat it, you 50-year-old mattress. <laughs> you, you miserable. My apologies. <laughs> Now, if you'll excuse me, I'm going to go take a long, hot, steamy bath with just enough water to barely cover my perky bosoms. <laughs> You're only going to sit in an inch of water? <laughs> Dessert at midnight? <laughs> There's always room for jello. <laughs> Getty had been heavily involved in the LGBT community. She was an activist of HIV and AIDS. She had lost close friends and family to the disease, among them her nephew, Stephen Schur, in 1992, whom she cared for after he was diagnosed with the disease, and her Torch Song trilogy co-star, Court Miller, in 1986. She later helped to open a hospice for AIDS patients in Greensboro, North Carolina, her nephew's hometown, called Beacon Place, which was still in operation as of 2021. It's after one o'clock. You're late. So dock me. You do this for free. Then be grateful. Oh, uh, one more thing. Your boyfriend was looking for you. Sam? He wheeled himself out here just to see me? Yeah. I don't get it. He must see a side of you that's hidden from the rest of the world. You're just jealous because you know you can never have me. <laughs> What's the matter? You don't watch General Hospital? This place is a passion pit. Hi, Sophia. Sam, how are you doing? I'm feeling real good today. I know, your strength's coming back. You wheeled yourself all the way down the hall. Have any visitors today? Mom and Dad were by this morning. They brought comic books. Did you bring me anything today? Don't I always? I thought maybe you forgot. I never forget. But I hate nectarines. <laughs> you have to eat. Sophia, it doesn't matter. You know that. Crazy talk. Comes from not eating enough fresh fruit. Here. Sophia, once they goofed up my blood with that transfusion, there wasn't anything anyone could do. No one's ever beat it, Sophia. But someday they will, and it could be tomorrow, and it could be you. I believe that, and you're going to believe that. Because right now, today, that's all we got. Hope. And a nectarine. And a nectarine. Getty had a strong fear of death, to the point where she avoided making jokes about death whenever possible and was uncomfortable when the show brought up the subject. Hey! You're not even going to ask what's wrong? What's wrong, Ma? I got three days to live. Fine, Ma. I'll scratch the Ben Gay off the grocery list. I can't believe you're so insensitive. Ma, you are not dying. I am, Dorothy. I had a dream last night, a death dream. Your father spoke to me. Spoke to you? How? I'm sitting in the living room, and the clock strikes nine. Then the bell rings. It's your father and his fedora. He always wore a fedora on Saturday. He walks towards me, reaches out his hand and says, Sophia, you can come now. There's room for you now. Ma, will you give it up? You are not 
dying. There is not going to be a doorbell. There is not going to be a pop. There is not going to be anything. You see, 10 seconds, nothing happened. Oh, God. <laughs> Ma, stop. Ooh, suddenly somebody believes me. Did I hear the bell? Listen, Rose, do me a favor. Look out the peephole and see who's at the door. Sure, Dorothy. Gee, it's kind of hard to tell. All I can see is a fedora. Oh, my God. <laughs> who's that a fedora? It's me, Blanche. <laughs> The other side. Dorothy, <coughs> should I get Sophia a glass of water? No, Rose, you should sit here and watch her hack herself to death. Are you sure? Get the water! All right, Dorothy, let me level with you. All my life I've been the practical one. Your father was the dreamer. So when this opportunity came along, I could hear his voice like he was standing next to me. Sophia, take a chance. Go for it. I didn't mean to hurt you, pussycat. I guess I did it for your father. Oh, Ma. That's a load of crap. <laughs> Ma, we have to pay our respects to the family. And listen, if you see Max, I don't want you making another scene like you did at the funeral. Scene? What scene? It's not my fault the clutch stripped over my foot and nearly fell into an open grave. You didn't have to yell, start shoveling, boys, as he tried to get Which of you was Fidel's girlfriend? Oh! My God! He had his burrow hitched to ever bed posted down. I'm leaving. I'm not about to mourn a man who's been with every woman in this room. He was never with me. I guess even he had his standards. <laughs> the man in that box was a bum. <laughs> a scoundrel, a cheat, and a liar. You got that right. Quiet. I work alone. He made me feel attractive and desirable again. He probably made the rest of you feel that way, too. And looking out at this kennel club, that was no small accomplishment. <laughs> Getty left in the early morning hours of July 22, 2008, at her home in Los Angeles, the result of dementia with Louis bodies. According to her family, it was three days before her 85th birthday. She was buried in Hollywood Forever Cemetery. Arthur was born Beatrice Frankel on May 13, 1922, in Brooklyn, New York City, New York, to Rebecca and Philip Frankel. Arthur was raised in a Jewish home with her older sister, Gertrude, and younger sister, Marion. During World War II, Frankel enlisted as one of the first members of the United States Marine Corps Women's Reserve in 1943. She served as a typist at a Marine headquarters in Washington, D.C. in June 1943 and later as a truck driver. She was honorably discharged at the rank of Staff Sergeant in September of 1945. Arthur was married twice, first in 1944 during her time in the military when she wed fellow Marine Robert Allen Arthur. They divorced three years later. She kept the surname but changed the spelling. Shortly after they divorced in 1950, she married director Jean Sachs, with whom she adopted two sons, Matthew, an actor, and Daniel, a set designer. She and Sachs remained married until 1978. Jumping forward, while B. Arthur was living in New York, she happened to travel to California with her husband. In 1971, Arthur was invited by Norman Lear to guest star on his sitcom, All in the Family as Maud Finley, the cousin of Edith Bunker, an outspoken liberal feminist. This was just supposed to be a guest spot. There's a person at the door. <laughs> Maud! <laughs> Edith! Maud! Didn't you get my telegram telling you to stay the hell away from here? <laughs> of course I got your telegram telling me to stay the hell away from here. Edith, honey, man, you can rest easy now. Marty is here. Edith, what's the matter with the man? sick! Edith, you can't be sick! What's gonna happen to us? Who the hell's gonna take care of us? 
Marty's here. Nearly 50, Arthur's performance on All in the Family impressed viewers as well as executives at CBS, who she would later recall, asked, Who is that girl? Let's give her her own series. Then there was Maud. Arthur's performance in the role garnered her several Emmy and Golden Globe nominations, including an Emmy win in 1977 for Outstanding Lead Actress in a Comedy Series. Maud also earned a place for Arthur in the history of the women's liberation movement. The show, of course, was a great hit, but by 1978, during the show's sixth season, Arthur decided to exit the series, later in 1978. Jumping forward once again, in 1985, at the age of 63, Arthur was cast in The Golden Girls in which she played Dorothy Spornak. B. Arthur was very hesitant to take the role of Dorothy Spornak in The Golden Girls. Knowing the cast members, B. Arthur said to Rue, I'm not interested in Maud and Vivian meet Sue Ann Nivens. I'll let Rue tell the story. She does it so much better. I'm getting called by Susan Harris saying, is there anything you can do to get B. Arthur to do this show? Because we'd worked together on Maud. And I said, oh, I, I've been wanting to work with her again. I'll come for a call. I called B. And I said, what is the matter with you? This is the best script you're ever going to read. And she said, Rue. <laughs> 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 I'm not interested in doing Maud and Vivian meet Sue Ann Niven. <laughs> I said, no, it's the other way around. I'm playing the vamp. Betty's playing the nitwit. <laughs> I said, oh, no, that's very interesting. <laughs> One of the unique things that B. Arthur had in her contract was she doesn't like wearing shoes. In fact, in the show, she demanded that whenever possible, they can put her in boots. There's only a few episodes where you actually see her in shoes. Well, this seems like a nice club, but it's for women only. What's wrong with a nice co-ed gym we just saw? <laughs> Come on now, Blanche, that was nothing but a pickup scene. People running around in skimpy outfits collecting phone numbers. That's not true. I was not in a skimpy outfit and I got all these. <laughs> Yvonne, we want to join a gym. Nothing radical, just lose a few pounds. Tone up. Yeah, slim down. Get into my summer wardrobe. Get into my winter wardrobe. Get into my bathrobe. <laughs> Yvonne, we are desperate women. You've got to help us. I know just what you need. Aerobics. It's what I do. I know you love aerobics. It stretches every muscle in your body. We better get you some outfits. Oh, it's okay. We brought our sweats. Sweats? Look, ladies, if you're serious about training, you want to get off on the right foot. Workout shoes. Now, these are beautiful and a bargain at $85. $85? That's a bit exorbitant. Anyone who's, you know, serious about training wouldn't even go near them. Well, then we'll take those. Fine. You'll also need aerobic suits, warm-up outfits, wristbands, headbands, leg warmers. Wait a minute, wait a minute. Leg warmers? Well, you need something to keep your thighs warm. What are you using now? Friction. That's why we're here. <laughs> Girls, shut up, Rose. <laughs>
The studio agreed only if she signed the contract that she could never sue the studio because she would want to walk around barefoot and they didn't want to get sued if she injured herself. <laughs> The name came from Kent Spornak, who is a producer and production manager. He lent his unique last name to Golden Girls character Dorothy. And if you remember Dorothy's ex-husband, you can see why they wanted the unique last name. It seemed to fit. Sorry, Kent. Do you remember the time I came over? Dorothy, I know it's been a while, but try and control yourself. I need some rest. <laughs> For. You're not getting into this bed, Stan. Then when am I supposed to sleep? On the floor like any dog. Oh, fuck. <laughs> Dan Spornak doesn't have to beg a woman to get into bed. Women come to me. Yeah. Right after they get the approval number on your MasterCard. <laughs> Good night. Oh, shut up. <laughs> uh. Stanley, if you're doing what I think you're doing, you're a big <laughs> I never had a mind for money matters. I always used to let Stanley handle all our investments. Did he have a head for numbers? Stanley? The man used to have to get naked to count to 21. <laughs> Arthur was a longtime champion of equal rights for women and an active advocate of the elderly and Jewish communities in both her major television roles and through her charity work. A longtime gay icon, she embraced the gay community that had supported her since the 1970s. Arthur took up the cause of LGBTQ plus youth homelessness. She raised 400000 for the Ali Forney Center with one of her final live performances. Arthur bequeathed 300000 to the Ali Forney Center a New York City organization that provides housing for homeless LGBTQ plus youths. Well, no matter what your reasons were, you obviously made the right decision. He probably went on to a very successful career in football. Actually, he was so crushed by my rejection that he gave up football and turned gay. <laughs> But you don't turn gay. You're either gay or you're not. Uh, you had nothing to do with it. Dorothy, if he had been gay before, he would have had better taste in jewelry. <laughs> Arthur succumbed to lung cancer at her home in Brentwood, Los Angeles, on April 25th, 2009. She was age 86. On April 28th in that same year, the Broadway community paid tribute to Arthur by dimming the marquees of New York City's Broadway Theater District in her memory for one minute at 8 p.m. Eddie Rue McClanahan was born in Helton, Oklahoma on February 21, 1934. She was the daughter of Dreta Rue Nell, a beautician, and William Edwin Bill McClanahan a building contractor. She grew up in Ardmore, Oklahoma. She graduated from Ardmore High School, where she acted in school plays and won the gold medal in orientation. A National Honor Society member, McClanahan earned a Bachelor of Arts degree at the University of Tulsa, where she majored in both German and theater. After several roles off and on Broadway, McClanahan first worked with actress Beatrice Arthur on the sitcom Maude in 1972 through 1978. McClanahan played Maude's best friend, Vivian Cavender. In 1972, she also did an episode of All in the Family, The Bunkers and the Swingers. McClanahan and Vincent Gardenia played a swinging couple who met the unsuspecting Bunkers. And just like with B. Arthur, it was a guest appearance. Here we are! <laughs> you must be Egypt. Yeah, who are you? The Red Police, Ruth and Curtis. I like this woman. Oh, I like her. <laughs> well, Ruth, you 
Dorothy? What do you think? Gee, I don't know. They're certainly different. That Edith seems so timid. Oh, that's just on the outside. Trust my first impression. Inside, she's a wildcat. <laughs> <laughs> All right, everybody. Hold it, hold it. Ready, set, switch. <laughs> They're here to change partners, but not for dancing. <laughs> Let's turn the picture. <laughs> Why does she answer our ad in the magazine? Oh, Edith, may maybe you can understand, dear. You see, our marriage was... Well, I mean, it just didn't seem to matter much anymore. Well, no more than the, the two cars, or, or the new washer-dryer, or the, the stereo set. We were drowning. Swinging saved us. Ah, the 70s. She also did at least two truckloads of TV and movie appearances, but I am trying to keep this to a minimum. Rue was married six times. I'm only going to bring up the first husband and the sixth husband. I mentioned the first husband because she had a son named Mark by him in 1958. She met the husband, Tom Bish, when she was a file clerk. They were married 17 months. And her sixth husband, Morrill Wilson, they married in 1997 until her death in 2010. She finally found true love, and she said of him, this is my last marriage, this man is a keeper. Now let's jump forward to when she was given the script to Golden Girls. With Rue, as the story goes, she said, when I got the script, before I even opened it, I just knew it was going to be great. Upon getting the script, Rue felt she was perfect for the role of Blanche. They told Rue, they have Betty White in mind for that role. They want you to read for Rose. I'm going to let Rue tell the story. She does it so much better. And then when I read it, I said, oh, I'm perfect for the role of Blanche. She said, well, they have Betty White in mind for that role. They want you to read Rose. And she said, Betty who? <laughs> so I was reading Rose for Jay Sandridge, obviously without my handle. Mm -hmm. And he said, I'm going to ask you to do something unorthodox. Will you go down the hallway and just look at the role of Blanche? I said, well, surely if I had to. <laughs> so I came back very quickly and he said, let me hear you read it. And I did. And then he said, thank you very much. And that was that. One of the unique things in Rue's contract, she got to keep all of Blanche's custom made clothing, which filled 13 closets at home. An animal rights advocate and vegetarian, McClanahan was one of the first celebrity supporters of people for the ethical treatment of animals. McClanahan was a supporter of gay rights, including advocating for same-sex marriage in the United States. In June of 1997, McClanahan was diagnosed with cancer, for which she was treated successfully. However, 13 years later, McClanahan died on June 3, 2010, at age 76, at New York Presbyterian Hospital after she suffered a brain hemorrhage. Cremated... Her ashes were given to her family. Betty Marion White was born in Oak Park, Illinois on January 17, 1922. She was the only child of Christine Tess, a homemaker, and Horace Logan White, a lighting company executive from Michigan. White's family moved to Alhambra, California in 1923 when she was a little over a year old and later to Los Angeles during the Great Depression. White attended Horace Main Elementary School in Beverly Hills and Beverly Hills High School, graduating in 1939. Her interest in wildlife was sparked by family vacations to the Sierra Nevada. White pursued an interest in writing. She wrote and played the lead in a graduation play at Horace Mann School and discovered her interest in performing. Inspired by her idols, Jeanette McDonald and Nelson Eddy, 
she decided to pursue a career as an actress. As the medium of television itself was still in development, White found work modeling. After the United States entered World War II in 1941, White volunteered for the American Women Voluntary Service. Her assignment included driving a PX truck with military supplies to the Hollywood Hills. Jumping forward a little bit, from 1952, White hosted and produced her own daily talk show, a variety show, called The Betty White Show. She even met Lucille Ball. And the two quickly struck up a friendship over their accomplishments in taking on the male-dominated television business in the 1950s and even competed against one another on various game shows. Betty had married three times. She met her first husband, Dick Barker, a United States Army Air Force pilot. After the war, the couple married and moved to Ohio. He wanted to embrace the simpler life but Betty did not enjoy this. They returned to Los Angeles and divorced within a year. In 1947, she married Lane Allen, a Hollywood talent agent. They divorced in 1949 because he wanted a family, but she wanted a career. On June 14, 1963, White married television host and personality Alan Ludden, whom she had met on his game show, Password. He proposed to White at least twice before she accepted. Alan Ludden died from stomach cancer in June 9, 1981 in Los Angeles, California. And she never remarried. When asked the reason for this in an interview with Larry King, White responded by saying, Once you've had the best, who needs the rest? In the United States, she was the first woman to produce a sitcom, Life with Elizabeth. Jumping forward to 1973, White made several appearances in the fourth season of The Mary Tyler Moore Show as the man-hungry Sue Ann Nivens. Although considering the role a highlight of her career, White described the character's image as icky sweet. <laughs> The Mary Tyler Moore Show's producers made Sue Ann Nivens a regular character and brought White into the main cast starting with the fifth season. Again, after many shows, too many to get into with this video, we jump to 1985. White scored her second signature role and the biggest hit of her career as the St. Olaf, Minnesota native Rose Nyland on the Golden Girls. Hi girls, what time does Clayton get here? Oh, any minute now. Oh, we better put out the welcome mat. <laughs> we don't have a welcome mat. What about the one Dorothy says is at the foot of your bed? <laughs> also a supporter and advocate of gay rights, saying there are gay relationships that are more solid than some heterosexual ones. She added, I think it's fine if they want to get married. I don't know why people get so anti-something. I'll bet I could sit here for a minute and tell you what your type is. I'm good at this. You just give me your honest reactions when people go by. That's how I'll tell. Okay. Here comes one. Go. No, too thin. Here comes one. Too short? Next. <laughs> Clayton. Clayton, you're not playing fair. There's a man. <laughs> That's a man and you're a man. You're both men. <laughs> Yeah, I'm gay, Rose. It's just so hard to tell Blanche the truth. Clayton, 
you're selling your sister short. Now, at times, Blanche can be very understanding and compassionate and forgiving. Get away from my baby brother, you cradle-snatching, empty-headed, two-faced <laughs> dummy! <laughs> and then at other times, she can be a real bitch. <laughs> White was a pet enthusiast and animal welfare advocate who worked with organizations including the Los Angeles Zoo Commission, the Morris Animal Foundation, and the African Wildlife Foundation. She produced and hosted a series, The Pet Set, which spotlighted celebrities and their pets. Uh, hold it, Rose. I need some advice, too. You need advice from me? Yeah, frightening, isn't it? <laughs> it's about Dreyfus. Okay. What about Dreyfus? The other day I thought he was lost, so I got a second dog, and then the first one came back. Sophia, are you kidding me? <laughs> Come see for yourself. Wow, two Dreyfuses. No, one Dreyfus. That's the point. I want to return the second. But I don't know how to tell which is which. That's where you come in. What do I do? Well, there's only one thing I can think of. We used to do it back on the farm, and I may be a little rusty, but I guess it's worth a shot. Whatever it is, do it. I'm desperate. Okay. Here goes. Dreyfus, come here, boy. Okay. <laughs> This one's Dreyfus. <laughs> Leaving us on the morning of December 31st, 2021, in the Brentwood neighborhood of Los Angeles from a stroke she had back on Christmas Day. She was two and a half weeks from her 100th birthday. Her remains were cremated and given to Glenn Kaplan. Lillian, I have some really good news. She's napping. What news? Well, I spent the day going around town, and I think I found the perfect place for her. Really? Well, it's not as nice as Shady Pines, but the staff really seems to care, and the, and the patients are happy. Well, Rose, that is fantastic. And it won't cost any more than Sunny Pastures? Well, that's the one little problem. Lillian's benefits won't quite cover the costs. She'll need another 150 a month. Little problem? Rose, how could you get our hopes up like that? I mean, who has an extra $150 a month? I do. What? I do. We'll use that bonus check I got at work. What? Don't you try and talk me out of it now. My mind is made up. Blanche, are you sure? Sure, I'm sure. Lily ought to be covered for at least two years with that money in my bosom account. <laughs> Blanche, I'm proud of you, but why the sudden change of heart? Having Lillian here made me realize that my problems are pretty trite. I suppose something like this does make your breasts seem rather small. <laughs> well, sort of. Well, then that's that. Lillian's problems are solved. Isn't this terrific? <laughs> terrific? Ma, this is wonderful. I mean, this is a real happy ending. So, how come I don't feel all that happy? I don't know. Is it because we know that Lillian's just plain lucky that a lot of old people do slip through the cracks and are forgotten? <sighs> and maybe it may not be too long until we are elderly, I say, hubs. The expression, the best laid plans, carries the connotation that one should not expect for things to always turn out to plan. I know, girls. Let's make a pact that we'll always take care of each other, that we'll <laughs> never desert each other no matter what. You can count on me. But right? you think it's going to be that easy getting rid of me, Rose? <laughs> that was rhetorical, Rose. <laughs> Oh, but what a comforting thought, knowing you'll never be alone. And listen, what the hell, if we do have to go to a nursing home, let's all go together. <laughs> <laughs> but what happens when there's only one of us left?
worry, I can take care of myself. <laughs> Hey, I hope you enjoyed the video. I'll see you in the next one. I know a poem that might help. It goes, never ever give up your dreams, even when they're doused in sorrow. Because even though they seem far away, they could come true tomorrow.